Nintendo has been continuing to update its Nintendo 64 library of games as a part of its Nintendo Switch Online service, and for November 2022, they gave us not just one, but two Mario Party games. We got one of the best in the series, Mario Party 2, and then the original game. Mario Party 1 has a pretty infamous reputation, and as someone who grew up with this game on my original Nintendo 64, it really does deserve that reputation. However, playing it again now for the first time since I was a child, I think the game is actually really interesting. More interesting than most players give it credit for. But before we go any further, this video is sponsored, once again by our friends from SanDisk. The Nintendo Switch has a lot of games, and I've noticed that recently I've been buying digital games far more frequently than I have physical. There's just something really convenient about having games like Mario Party and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate as digital downloads instead of physicals. But this means I very quickly find that I run out of storage space on my Nintendo Switch. Luckily for me, SanDisk were gracious enough to provide me with a free 400GB SD card. The Nintendo licensed memory card for Nintendo Switch from SanDisk has different themes for each of its different sizes, with the 128GB, 256GB, 400GB models being Mario Kart themed. But there are also Animal Crossing and Legend of Zelda themed cards as well. The one I have has a blue shell on it, so I'm prepared in case anyone tries to defeat me at Mario Kart. I won't be the only Crash King in this race. If you want to play with power and get a great addition to your Nintendo Switch, then you can find a link to purchase these cards in the description. So let's get this out of the way first. Just because I think Mario Party 1 is interesting, doesn't mean I think it's good. There's a reason that this is the first time Nintendo has ever re-released this game. Playing both Mario Party 1 and Mario Party 2 back to back, it is kind of wild how much of Mario Party 2 is just a refined version of the original game. It mainly shows up with the minigames, as all of the best ones from Mario Party 1 are also in Mario Party 2, either wholesale with a new coat of paint, or with the issues of the original fixed. Mario Party 1 feels like a beta for Mario Party 2, and that similarity is probably why both of them got dropped on the Nintendo Switch Online service at the same time, and why Mario Party 2 has seen re-releases, but the original never did. But while both games are similar, and Mario Party 2 is better, playing it again now as an adult, I never realised how many unique ideas Mario Party 1 has that managed to make it stand on its own against its successors. Reasons that I think give it a reason to be played, and why it should deserve more respect than the internet gives it. Let's start with something simple, but pretty important to Mario Party. The boards. The game has 8 boards to play on, which is more than most other Mario Party games, and the gimmicks they have range from being pretty standard to pretty wild. DK's Jungle Adventure and Yoshi's Tropical Island are both pretty standard boards for the series, with the gimmick in the latter being that the star doesn't move unless someone steps on a happening space. Luigi's Engine Room and Wario's Battle Canyon both use gimmicks that will show up in later games as well, available paths changing every turn and a board divided into four specific sections, but there is enough funkiness here to keep them feeling fresh in this game. And then Peach's Birthday Cake, which appeared again recently in Mario Party Superstars, seems like a standard board on the surface, but the star doesn't move and more focus is placed on stealing stars from your opponents using the piranha plants. But it's the last three boards that I think do the most to stand out, and those are Mario's Rainbow Castle, Bowser's Magma Mountain, and the Eternal Star. The first one of those is the only one that players start with, and its gimmick is that, well, it's just a straight line. There are two alternative paths in this board, one that leads to a boo and the other that's just a little bit longer, but the end goal is the same, the central tower where players will purchase the star. On the surface, that might sound boring, but where the twist comes in is that when a star is purchased or a happening space stepped on, Toad will swap places with Bowser, who charges twice as much money for one of his stars, which are fake and can't be used. This simple mechanic turns this board into a game of chance and timing, as when Toad is out, players want to get to the end of the map ASAP, but when Bowser is out, it's the complete opposite. The player is incentivized to go as slow as possible. 
This creates such a unique dynamic, where players are taking longer routes and hoping for turn skips just so they can avoid making progress. It's great and something future Mario games never really tried again. Then there are the two unlockable stages. Bowser's Magma Mountain is as evil as you might expect for a Bowser board. It has two gimmicks, one involves paying to play a roulette to take a shortcut. This is optional and if you lose then you only lose 10 coins, no biggie. But one of the statues isn't optional and if you lose that you get sent straight to Bowser who can take a star from you. Now that's rough. But that's not actually the interesting gimmick. The really interesting gimmick is that if you step on a happening space, it swaps all the blue coin spaces with red coin spaces, and vice versa, meaning you will be losing money every turn until someone steps on a happening space again. Absolutely evil. And lastly, you have Eternal Star, which is as chaotic as a Mario Party board should be. You progress around the board using randomised warps that Bowser has control over and you don't get stars from Toad but instead the Koopa Kid. There are 7 of him about and you not only need 20 coins still to get a star but then you have to beat him in a dice rolling game. You have to pay to have a chance at the star, not a guarantee. And if you run into actual Bowser as you travel, say goodbye to a star instead and say hello to the starting position because you are going back. And like I mentioned before, where you end up on the board is random, so there is no strategy here. Just pick a road and pray it doesn't end up at the Cooper King. I imagine there might be some of you out there who aren't really jiving with these boards. After all, they rely so much on randomness, and that isn't really everyone's cup of tea. But honestly, I love it. Mario Party is at its best when it's peak random, as it removes any notion of skill and keeps all players balanced. But it's not like the game requires no skill at all, because you have the minigames and they are also pretty unique in Mario Party 1. It's obvious that the designers of this game were still trying to figure out the best way to balance a Mario Party game, because the minigames and rewards are all over the place. It follows the very basic set of minigame categories, 4 player minigames where everyone is against everyone else, then 2 vs 2 minigames where you work with a partner to win, and then 1 vs 3 minigames where everyone gangs up or gets bullied by a single player. But calling them 1 vs 3 isn't entirely correct, because some of them are designed more like 4 player minigames, but one player just has an advantage over the others. And in fact, there are even some 4 player minigames that are cooperative, where all players have to work together and everyone wins money. Then there are also one player minigames, which happen when a player lands on a minigame space, where just that player takes part. And of course, Bowser minigames as well, but these aren't unique in Mario Party 1, they're just minigames that you can normally find while playing, but with much stricter rules applied and much bigger punishments. And let's talk about punishments, because Mario Party 1 does something that no other Mario Party has done, and that's have players lose coins for losing minigames. The way coins are distributed after a minigame is honestly all over the place. For starters, there are a lot of minigames where you just get however many coins you get from the game itself. These are special types of minigames in later games, but here they are very common. Minigames that don't fall into this category usually just provide 10 coins for winning, but whoever loses the minigame actually loses 5 coins, just to add insult to injury. In 2 vs 2, it almost feels like the player is taking coins from opponents. This is especially true on the 4 player minigames where only one person loses. There are a handful of games in this where as soon as a single person falls, the game ends and that loser loses 15 coins, whereas the other three only get 5 each. Talk about absolutely savage. There are some mini games where you get nothing for a draw, and others where everyone gets something, and then there are 1 vs 3 mini games where the 1 can get coins and the 3 can't, but will lose coins instead if they fail the mini game. It is really all over the place, and I totally get why future games standardised it. It's hard to play tactically when you have no idea how the minigame is going to affect your wallet. And yeah, this is one part of Mario Party 1 that I do think is bad, but I can't deny it isn't an interesting take on the series. The way coins are handled and distributed is both random but also consistent. Boo is here and his coin sealing services are free in this one, but he's pretty bad at it. Uh, at least at the start of the game, he gets better as it goes along. Koopa, on the other hand, will give you 10 coins every time you pass the start. 
Bowser also appears on every map, just like Toad, but he consistently charges you 20 to 40 coins depending on the map difficulty for whatever service he is scamming you out of. And then of course you've got blue and red spaces as well which give and take away 3 coins when you land on them, except for the final 5 turns where they give 6. So yeah, there is an element of randomness and consistency to coins and stars, which is weird because coins are more important here than ever thanks to the mushroom shop. Now the item shop doesn't exist in Mario Party 1, items aren't added until Mario Party 2. The mushroom shop lets players spend money outside of the boards and not just on minigames which is the case for basically every other Mario Party game. Instead you buy extras and options and this was the feature that made me want to make this video in the first place. Mario Party games have had simple options like turn limits, CPU difficulty and where the bonus stars are on and off, and later games also let you decide on the types of minigames that appear. But this Mario Party has so much more thanks to the items you buy. Some of these items are just extras, like a sound test or the credits, or the mecha fly guy that counts how many times players have injured themselves in the minigame house, but they aren't the interesting items. In Mario Party 2 and onwards there are secret blocks that appear randomly as you play, offering either a star or coins to whoever finds them. There are also items that affect dice rolls or change your position on the board, but in Mario Party 1 these are all items that you can turn on and off to fully customise how you play. Want a random chance of your next dice rolling only 1 to 3? How about a dice that appears randomly and takes away coins from you? One that will randomly swap the player's position on the board with another? Or a block that will randomly summon Boo, Cooper or Bowser? It's all here and turning these all on can lead to an absolutely chaotic game of Mario Party 1. And those are just the blocks. You can also buy the option to turn Boo or Koopa off, and you can buy special coin boxes that affect how much money you earn from playing. One applies 10% interest to the coins you collect, while the other lets you gamble all your earnings, possibly seeing them halved, but possibly seeing them doubled instead. Tempting. And what I like about these is that they are options. Mario Party at its core is about collecting 20 coins, getting a star, and whoever has the most stars at the end wins. Everything else, from all the random elements to minigames to items, are just extras, but they must exist, they cannot be switched off. And while the original Mario Party doesn't go to this extreme, the fact that you can customise your game in this way is really cool. You can go all random or none at all and remove extraneous advantages for getting new coins. It's just a neat feature and I don't understand why this one never came back. And that's the main reason that I think this game is still worth playing, even though Mario Party 2 and later offerings are objectively better games. Mario Party 1 just has some really neat features and mechanics in its boards, minigames and options. I haven't even mentioned Minigame Island yet, a single player campaign where you go through every minigame in difficulty order, with the prize at the end being some exclusive single player minigames. But if you need another reason to play Mario Party 1, it's how quick it actually is. I'm used to Mario Party games taking a while, and when me and my friends saw that the light play option was 20 turns, we laughed. 20 turns is the standard in modern Mario Party, not light. But they weren't kidding in this game. With the lack of items and battle mini games and other extra features from later entries, turns in Mario Party 1 are surprisingly quick, and that doesn't even account for the skip turn space, which is hilarious and has never come back in a future Mario Party game. So I think Mario Party 1 deserves to be remembered and still played thanks to its unique and early take on the series, making it stand out from the others. It is an interesting game, with some fun and not so fun quirks. Just don't play mini games where you need to spin the stick, just, just don't. Nintendo's warning for that is nonsense because you just can't spin the stick fast enough without burning a hole through your hand. If Bowser's Tug of War ever appears in a minigame selection, every player should just put their controllers down in protest. I'm telling you, it's not worth the damage you'll receive. I want to thank Sandisk again for sponsoring this video. A link to where you can find the cards will be in the description below. A special thanks as well to all of our patrons, the $5 up tier are on screen right now, and a link to how you can join them is also in the description below. Let me know what you think about Mario Party, of which one's your favourite Mario Party, and if you agree with me on the unique mechanics and how fun Mario Party 1 actually can be. I'm curious if this is just a me thing or not. Anyway, 
You can keep up to date with all of our content by subscribing, and that way you'll always remember to return to the source.